Sometimes announcements are straight up boring. But tonight, we're going to look at these announcements that we're going to look at are not boring. Not by any stretch of the imagination. Imagine tonight that, I don't know, because of Christmas, that we were to dim the lights and and turn all the lights down in here, and maybe just the trees were on, or maybe we had candles burning, and it was very, very dim in here. And I said, okay, it's time for announcements. And then all of a sudden, everything was bright, and there was someone standing before you who you've never seen before, shining brightly, and giving you some crazy announcement. Not just, hey, you know, we're going to have this activity, or we're praying for this, but something that would shake your world and rattle your life and turn your whole life completely upside down. That would take everything that you had planned and everything that you were looking to do with your life and completely flip it upside down. All the plans that you had built, all the dreams that you had, all the things that you were looking forward to, this one announcer comes in and everything gets turned upside down in a very dramatic way, too. It's not like you got a letter in the mail or a text or an email. You had an in-person visit from an angel of God. And you know what we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the announcements to uh, Mary and Joseph. Now, to you and me, because we're in 2020, we're about 2,000 years removed, and we've heard the Christmas story over and over again. This is kind of like, yeah, we know the angel came and talked to them, and he told them what was going to happen. But I want to look specifically tonight. There's some illustrations, or I'm sorry, there's some applications in here tonight that are, are really pertinent to you and me. Now, as far as I know, uh, there's not anybody going through exactly what they're going through, right? That would be, again, miraculous and strange. But there are things that all of us go through um, that would that these messages, and here's what I want us to focus on tonight, the heart and the attitude of those receiving the messages, how they responded to the Lord with earth-shattering news. Okay, so Luke 1, we're going to begin in verse 26, and we're going to read through verse 38, okay? And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind, What manner of salutation this should be? And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. I love that. Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now, that, again, in our setting today, knowing how this story goes, we can kind of just blink through that and go, yeah, that's cool. But just imagine being a teenage girl, engaged, as we would put it, and this is the message that you get 
from an, a, a man, an angel who comes into your house and says these things to you. I don't know. We don't get recorded here any of Mary's reactions. Sometimes it records reactions of people. They fall down, they faint, they fall backwards, you know, they, they're scared. We don't, we don't get any of her reactions. And I don't know. Maybe she was just that strong of a young lady that it didn't really, you know, phase her too much where she was just like, hey, you know, I'll just do whatever the Lord wants. But I have to think that being a human being and being a teenage girl who had this kind of experience, this would have rocked her world. And I love how the Lord gives us kind of her responses and how you can see Mary's heart throughout it as you hear God's message for her. And there's some wonderful uh, applications in here for you and me. So let's begin with just going back to the beginning here, verse 26. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now you'll remember in the Old Testament when Gabriel uh, was trying to get news to Daniel. Remember Daniel has been praying for three weeks, 21 days. Daniel was praying because he had seen a vision and he says to God, Lord, I don't understand what this means. Will you give me understanding? And God answers his prayer and sends Gabriel to give him the understanding of the vision. But a couple demons engage Gabriel on his way to Daniel. And, and Gabriel finds himself fighting some demons. And then uh, God sends Michael along. And Michael says, let me take over from here. You go give the message. And Michael begins to fight them while Gabriel goes and gives a message to Daniel. I think it's so cool to me that God just looks over at Gabriel and says, go to earth and give the message. And Gabriel comes to earth and gives a message. I don't know about you, but to me that is so awesome. There's something just incredible about that. There's something powerful about the God of the universe who can look at one of his messengers who happened to be a warrior, obviously, by the way, and say, go, give him a message. You see, Gabriel was a messenger, but don't forget, he held off demons, two demons, for 21 days. So he's not a wimp. So when Gabriel comes into uh, to Mary's house that night, or wherever she was, it's not a dude that looked like me. Okay, <laughs> let's just put it that way. It was probably a strong, powerful-looking man who came in and gave her this message. He sent from God to Nazareth, directly to Mary. 27, to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. He was of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So we get some important information there about who's involved, the subjects here. A virgin who's engaged, named Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, watch this, Hail, Thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. What a message. He comes right in, and he says, you, you are highly favored of God. And this is the same kind of words that God uses when he talks about Noah. Um, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, favor. So no, somehow, God showed grace and favor on Mary, and he chose her to be the recipient, not only of this news, but to carry his child and raise his child. It must have been some lady. She was highly favored. And he says, blessed are you among women, not above women. That's, it's important. Because Mary's not God. She's not deity. There are some Christian denominations who place her in a role of deity. They say prayers to her. They consider her as part of the Godhead. And that's just not the case. She's an individual young woman who God had grace on and chose her to do something incredible for himself. So he says to her, you are blessed among women. And then 29, and when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. That's a nice way of saying she was really worked up. But notice, not at his appearance at his saying. I might have lost it over the fact that there's somebody in my house who is a, a man that is a warrior telling me this. Just the appearance would have freaked me out. Angie, I don't know about you, but if somebody like this shows up in your house, Mike Graver's probably got something for him, you know? Maybe. So, so here we have, 
he shows up and she's troubled at his saying. I would, have, I would have lost the saying for just the presence, right? For the presence of the person being there. But she heard him out. She's troubled at his saying and cast, she begins to think, what's this all about? What's he trying to say? What, what does he mean by this? Instead of, who are you? Why are you here? This is amazing to me. 30. And the angel said unto her, her fear not Mary. So evidently there was some concern there. He could see at least on her face that something was troubling her. He says, fear not, says her name. Love that. And we see here that when God brings a message to us, it's a personal message. And so whenever you find yourself reading the Word of God, or whenever you are hearing a song, or you're hearing a message, and God is speaking to your heart, friend, it's not like a shotgun thing, it's a direct message to you. We had the testimony this morning of of somebody who attended, and after the service, they said, Pastor, you got to me this morning. And I said, actually, the good news is I didn't get to you. God got to you. I said, that message was directly from him. I was just the deliverer, you know. And that's, that's exactly what it is. We, we tend to think in terms of this song, this singer, this preacher, this teacher, but really what it is is the Holy Spirit of God is using these deliverances, these ways of getting his message, and they are personal to you. So whenever you hear something and you're like, you feel that Holy Spirit tapping on your shoulder or speaking into your ear, it's not a shotgun thing. That's a generic kind of a thing. It's a specific message to you from God. Almost like he's saying your name. What an awesome thing, isn't it? That the God of the universe would would know you enough to bring a personal message to you. And he says, Mary... You have found favor with God. Again, God is showing His grace to you. Verse 31, And behold, here's the news, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's a lot of info. You are going to conceive a child, and you are going to bring forth a son. You are going to have a boy, and you will call his name Jesus, which is different because typically you would use the name of somebody in your lineage. But he has been appointed a name from God. You will call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. You have to understand for a Jew, this is earth shattering news. Whoever gets the throne of David is the king. And a a virgin in Nazareth gets told, your son, that you're going to conceive of is going to be the king and sit on David's throne. I mean, that is... Ladies, you remember when you heard that you were going to have a child. You you remember how exciting that news was and how wonderful that... And then you began to wonder, what is this child going to look like? Uh, What are are we going to name that child? What are they going to do? How are they going to grow up? You know... All the, what's the room going to look like? You began to wonder all of these things and dream and, and have vision of what you wanted to do for this, that, and the other. The excitement of receiving the news. When you get told by an angel as a virgin teenager who's not even married yet that you're going to have a son and he's going to sit on the throne and he's going to be the king and he's going to be great and he's going to be called the son of the highest, hello. That is not just your everyday announcement. This is no boring announcement. And so then Mary somehow has a coherent thought and asks a question. In verse 34, she says, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? So she's just going back to the first thing. (laughs) Not all of the he's going to be the king. But she goes back to, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Level with me here. I'm a virgin. How is that going to take place? I've never known a man. 
And I love the question. I love her heart. I love her sincerity. I love the fact that you have a teenage girl who had the guts to ask a question to an angel. There's something special here. And I love how God lets us in on this give and take. Because you know what it shows me? It shows me that sometimes God is going to give us a personal message and we're going to say, I just don't know. How? How? Is it okay to ask a question? Well, evidently, the, the angel doesn't zap her and say, on to the next girl. Oh, ye of little faith. Thank the Lord, right? How many times would he have just gotten, you know, set us aside and gone on to the next person? But I love the fact that she just asks the question, an honest question from her heart. And I like this. Look at the angel's response. It doesn't say that he raised his hands or that he cried unto her. Or that he, you know, pointed in her face. They're having a conversation. And the angel said, here's how it's going to happen. Good question. Maybe he said good question. Here's how it's going to happen. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. First of all, the Holy Ghost, you see God already involved. That's important to remember. The Holy Ghost, okay, shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest, capital H, God the Father, shall overshadow thee. Therefore, okay, so that's, that's how it's going to happen. The Holy Ghost, God is going to uh, make sure the Holy Ghost is going to conceive this child in your womb. Now watch this. Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God because God is directly involved in the conception of this child. The child is conceived in your womb by God himself. God placed this child in your womb. And that's why he's going to be called the Son of God. He's not just the Son of Man, although he is. And that's actually a name that Jesus used for himself a lot, the most, actually. The Son of Man. But he's not just that. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you thankful that he's not just the Son of Man? He is not just like you and I. You and I are 100% man, human. He is 100% man, but he is 100% God. And that's, a, that's an important distinction between Jesus and you and me and Jesus and Mary and Jesus and Joseph. And, by the way, Jesus and every other human that's ever lived. It's an important distinction. But he just, they're just having this conversation. It's like, I don't understand how this is going to happen. You know, I've never known a man. He says, here's how it's going to happen. The Holy Ghost and the highest are going to take care of this. They're going to put this child in your womb. That's all you need to know is that you're going to have a child in your womb and it's going to be God's son. And I, I enjoy the fact that when you and I are given specific messages, specific news, where God says something to you, and when you say, I just, Lord, help me understand this. Not in an angry or, you know, an accusative, accusatory way, but it's in a, Lord, help me understand this. That, that's, that's pretty big news. How, how is that going to happen? He doesn't, you know, lash out. He, he gives us an answer. He says, you know, here's how, here's how it's going to happen. Now, do you think she understood everything he just said? The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. The, the highest will overshadow you. Oh, okay, that makes perfect sense. No, it, it didn't make sense to her. But she knew that God was involved. And if God's involved, it's okay. It's going to be okay. If God's involved, if God is overseeing the operation, it's going to be okay. And of course there's going to be issues for this young lady and for her espoused husband. But it's going to be okay. And then he just drops this. <laughs> Verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. I mean, if it wasn't enough to hear that, now she's finding out that her much older cousin, Elizabeth, is with child, six months pregnant. The one who, by the way, was called barren. Never had a child before, and in her old age is six months pregnant. A whole lot of miracles being divulged here to a teenage girl in a city like Nazareth, which is no special place. Seemingly no special person. But that's how our God works. 
He finds places on earth that are not super big and well-known. He finds people on earth who are not the greatest and the strongest and the most powerful. And somehow, like the New Testament says, He takes those who are weak and lowly and He uses them as vessels to get His truth out through them. And they're no different. They're just still an individual made of dust that God energizes for His purposes. And by the way, He wants to do that with you and me as well. And then one of our favorite things to hear, verse 37, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Nothing is impossible. Impossible is nothing for God. Clearly, that's the case because you had a barren woman who's (laughs) pregnant, and now you have a virgin who's pregnant. Nothing is impossible with God. So then Mary responds like anybody else would. Very, (laughs) you know, rationally calm, it seems. And she says, behold, here I am, the handmaid of the Lord. That means I will wait by your side and do whatever you ask. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. In other words, here I am, I'm at your side, you ask me whatever you want, and I will do it. What a great attitude of heart of a teenage girl. And it reminds me that the next time that I think that our teenagers are just teenagers, that we, you know what, that's a bad thing to say. Because Jesus, God didn't look at Mary as just a teenager, as just a young lady who was silly and goofy. And, And yes, they are. Teenagers can be. We all were when we were, right? If we could play back the video. By the way, <clears throat> quick, quick heart check here. What would things be like if you and I had social media when we were teenagers? I probably wouldn't be standing here right now, okay? You would have scrolled through that and said, no, nah, this guy ain't for us, right? Let's be real. What would we have taken pictures of? What would we have posted? No, not me. Pa- Come on now. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. We would have. We've got to cut him a little bit of break. But here, here's a young lady who, who God said, I'm going to show grace to you. I'm going to show favor on you. And I'm going to use you for my glory. And he can still do that today with our young people. He can still use them to, to carry out his will. Do we have that kind of heart, though? When God gives us that message, when he says your name attached to a message, and as crazy as it may sound, do we say, Lord, yeah, here I am by your side. Whatever you say, I'll do it. Whether it's a big announcement or a small announcement, is that our heart? So that's Mary. Let's quickly go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. See how old Joe handles this, all right? How's Joseph going to handle this? Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 18 through 25. Here's another announcement that's not boring. Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, or in this way. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together... She was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Note, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately or secretly. But while he thought on these things, while he considered this, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, 
did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and he and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Another wild announcement. Have you ever had one of those dreams where you wake up and you go, I'm pretty sure that was a dream and that never happened and I hope it never happened and you're just kind of troubled to your core at everything that just took place in your dream. I had one of those dreams recently. I shared it with Brother Mark when we were on our way to lunch one day. And I told him how crazy and scary it was. And I said, man, I hope that's not, you know, going to be. Um, but I woke up troubled. I woke up thinking, no, please, Lord, no. <laughs> you know, I, it, was, it was one of those things. And it, it really went with me through the day. Well, this wasn't just the fact that Joseph had too much spaghetti sauce before dinner. Okay? This was God visiting him in a dream. And God visited him in a dream, and he, he said to him, after the news came out that Mary was pregnant, let's just stop for a minute and consider if Mary was a teenager in our church, and she walked in, she was engaged, and she walked in here pregnant before the wedding. What would be the thoughts? Okay. Now, a teenager in our church pregnant before their wedding is not Mary. I don't think God's going to do that again. So it's a different scenario, but here's the thing. Here's what I'm trying to point out. The people in her congregation, in her neighborhood, in her life, even from probably her family and his, were all thinking either they had messed up or she had messed up with someone else. And I can't imagine the names that she was being called. I can't imagine the way that people would look at Joseph and say, you're going to marry her after she went and did that? Could you imagine just the, the surrounding looks that they were getting on a daily basis? Who knows? I mean, they may not even have been welcome in the fellowship. You know, I don't know, but people are people, man. And those people did not understand what God was doing here. And I'm sure that they were under some serious ridicule. And it really wasn't their fault. But here, here's Joseph. He's a guy who went to bed that night. He said he was a just man. He wanted to do the right thing. And the right thing by the law was to write a bill of divorcement saying, you know, I'm, I'm not going to marry her. I'm going to put her away. But... At the same time, verse 19, he didn't want to make her a public example. What a guy. That's a good thing. He, this guy had a heart. He actually loved her, it seems. He actually cared about her, and he didn't want to make her an example. So Joseph went to bed that night struggling, right? He went to bed that night struggling over, man, I, this is crazy, Lord. I love her. And I know the right thing to do is to write this, but I don't want to see her drugged through the mud. And, and if you remember in John chapter 8, when the woman was taken in adultery there, what were they supposed to do according to the law? And so Joseph cares about Mary, and he thinks, I don't want that to happen to her. And, and he, he may even have been thinking, and if they think I'm involved, I'm going down for this too. So he was going to bed struggling with, what do I do? I just, he was struggling with a decision here. And by the way, listen to this, and I want you to hear this. God involved Joseph and Mary in his plans. Okay? And they were struggling with questions. And what does God do? He gives them enough to get on with life. He gives them enough light and enough foresight to know to take the next step. And friend, when God involves you in His plans, He will give you enough to move forward. He, he's, he's not obligated to give us the end picture. He's not obligated to give us ten steps from now. But God, in His grace, gives us enough to know to keep going, to keep following Him. And you can, you can count on that, that God will give you enough. To keep going when he involves you in his plans, by the way, not vice versa. Okay? 
We, we saw in the Old Testament how couples decided, oh, we're not having children fast enough, so let's preempt this bad boy, right? And then it's like, ah, then they made some messes, and, and then God had to work some things around. It, it doesn't bother him because he's God. He has a way. But they were trying to involve God in their plans, and there was a mess. But when God says your name, and he involves you in his plans, he'll give you enough to go the next step. That's important to remember. And so he says to Joseph in this dream, I love this, verse 20, while he thought on these things. He probably fell asleep considering this. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. Joseph, <clears throat> thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, this was all done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. There was a, a scenario in, in the writing of Isaiah where they were asking for a sign, and, and, and Isaiah says, Here, you're going to get a sign, all right. You're going to get a sign that this is God's people and God's place, and here's, here's the sign you're going to get. Behold, a virgin is going to conceive, and uh, she's going to give birth, and you're gonna, he's going to be named Emmanuel. That was the, the prophecy that Isaiah gave, <clears throat> and that's the reference here. So then Joseph wakes up, 24, and did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. He put his reputation on the line. <clears throat> he put his plans. He put all of his goals and even maybe his dreams on the line. Maybe he was planning on Joseph Jr. I don't know, <laughs> you know, if that ever came. But everything that Joseph had planned and dreamed and thought that this, this, this engagement and this wedding was going to take place and everything was going to be beautiful and perfect and they were going to have children and live happily ever after in Nazareth, God interrupts his life and says, no, that's not my plan for you. In fact, it's pretty crazy what I've got lined out for you, so I need you to carry this out for me. Joseph wakes up and does as God asked him to do. Down to the fact that he took Mary as his wife. And I'm sure that Joseph was relieved to know this too, by the way, that this was God's doing. And Mary still loved him and was faithful to him. And then Joseph, 25, knew her not till she brought forth her firstborn son. And what did he call his name? Jesus. Just like the angel of the Lord told him, just like the angel of the Lord told Mary. And so we got some not boring announcements here. Some things that took place that came into the lives of everyday people just like you and me. Who God said, I'm going to involve you in my plans. And when I involve you in my plans, I will give you enough information to take the next step. I will answer the questions you have enough to give you the next step. And then, because God knows that you and I do not contain the faith to know steps A through Z and to see the whole outcome. We don't have enough faith to, to get through that. So he, he says, I'll, I'll give you what you can handle. I'll give you what you need, what I want you to know at this point so that you can continue to follow me. And both Mary and Joseph decided to follow the Lord and did exactly what he said. You know what I think is cool? God asks people, listen, to be involved in his purposes whom he believes will follow him. That's really encouraging. Because if God's speaking to you and asking you to get involved in something that he's got going on, that means he has confidence that you're going to carry it out. I mean, he didn't just, you know, randomly pick two names out of the Nazareth phone book. <laughs> God knows right where you are. He knows the exact uh, job or vocation or task that he has for you, involving you in his plans, involving you in his will. And when he does that, and when we say yes, and we follow him, and we carry out what he's asked us to do, crazy as it may seem, he can do great things with just regular people. 
He'll take care of all the reputation stuff. He'll take care of all the hearsay and the gossip and the talking that goes on. We don't need to concern ourselves with that. We just need to follow Jesus as he gives us light and let him handle all of that. And I don't know of any two, as far as human beings go, I don't know of any two more obedient and just kind of, if you want to have them, role models in the faith than Mary and Joseph. I just said, yeah, Lord. Whatever your plans are, we're in. What an incredible thought. I wonder if that's our heart tonight with whatever God has brought into your life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these accounts of these two very real people who are just like us, Lord, just everyday common people, just going about their lives, doing their best, it seems, to, to, to follow you and, you know, as, as we can. And Lord, we thank you for the testimony that, first of all, you, you involve people in, in your work. It's a privilege of ours. And Lord, I'm thankful for that, the idea that when you call us into your work, it's because you believe and you know that you've equipped us to handle it. Lord, I pray that you would give me the heart and the attitude of Mary and Joseph. That yes, I may have questions, and yes, I may not understand it all, but yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I just will do whatever you ask me. And Lord, is, and, and if we, our reputation may take a hit or people may not understand where we're coming from or what we're doing, but Lord, as long as we're following you, as long as you're involving us in your plans and we're following you, Lord, let us just to keep our eyes on you and to keep walking and to trust. And Lord, I do pray for our young people as we consider the, the youth in this passage tonight. Lord, we know that you... There's no age limit on serving you or being used by you. And Lord, I know there's people on either side of this auditorium tonight who have hearts for you. Teenagers, middle schoolers and high schoolers, and college kids. Lord, who, who love you, and they're just trying. Lord, they're just trying to follow you. We thank you, Lord, for them. I love to see their heart, their enthusiasm, their desire to be here in your house, Lord. It's, it's exciting. It, it's life-giving, Lord. It's energizing, and we thank you for them. But, Lord, we pray that you would give them hearts of obedience and humility, that when you involve them in your plans, that they would say yes, and, Lord, we would do nothing but encourage them and get involved as much as we can to help them carry out your will for their lives so that they can follow you as we follow you, and you do great things. And we ask these things in Jesus' name.